Okay, um, now watch. You will take the respiratory slash kidney uh, quiz on Thursday. Uh, if you're going to take the multiple choice, you can start at uh, 2 o'clock. You got me? I will give you the same opportunity to get extra credit for that pulmonary function curve, so I will uh, attach that to it. Say yes. And um, then the only other quiz left before the final will be the uh, cranial nerve quiz. And you know what's expected of you, right? So the day that you we come back from um, our little Easter break, at 2 o'clock I'm starting it. I will give you 20 minutes to write it out. Say yeah. If you're not here at 2 o'clock, then it, you're cutting into your time. And that test is time. Say yeah. Okay. Hang on. Whoop. What's that? Um, do you have notes or anything on the cranial nerves? Um, yeah, on the nervous system PowerPoint, they're, okay. uh, I got them outlined okay. mm -hmm. with their basic function. But you can go online and find that stuff, right? It's everywhere. It's like Savoir Fair. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to um, we're gonna start the immune system today. Well, you never eat before. I know. The immune system is uh, pretty complicated, yeah? So I'm going to do my best to simplify it. So from now on, the rest of the stuff that we talk about, what might be a really good idea is if you print out the final. Say yeah. How many questions are on the final? 36. Well, that's okay. Could be worse. Could be 37. Or I could have to take it. Say yeah. Okay, here we go. Watch. Here's the arterial end. Uh, the arterial, and here's the arterial capillary network. I'm making this up. If 10 cc's of blood goes into the arterial end of the cap, yep. Are you recording? Yes. If 10 cc's of arterial blood goes into the capillary network, how many cc's of blood leave through the venous end? Is it A, 10 cc's, B, less than 10 cc's, or three greater than 10 cc's. Which one is it? Huh? Yeah. No. C. Three. No. Oh. So but what's your other choice? Okay, good. That's B. It's less than 10 cc's. Right? I know, that's kind of bad. All right, so watch. Watch. If you recall, capillaries are under pressure, right? The arterial end of the capillary has pressure. And what it will do is it will force water, plasma, and small proteins out of the interstitial space. Are you with me? Therefore, the amount of blood leaving through the venous end is going to be less than 10 cc's. You got me? But you have kind of a sewer system located all over your body, except for your central nervous system, and that's called the lymphatic system. Say yeah. So you better write this down. So one of the functions of the lymphatic system is to take small proteins and plasma and plasma that have escaped the cardiovascular system and bring them back 
bring that fluid and small proteins back to the central circulation. So think of the lymphatic system as kind of like the sewer system of the body. Any excess water that collects around your house is drained off by the sewer system and brought back to the lake. So any excess fluid or small proteins that escape the cardiovascular system, those are brought back by the lymphatic system. So if you were to compare lymph vessels to arteries and veins, lymph vessels are more like what? Arteries or veins? Lymph vessels are more like veins, right? So tell me what you know about veins, systemic veins. Tell me what you know. What? Right, no pressure. They got one-way valves. What kind of blood is taken back to the heart? The right? So blood that's low in oxygen and high in CO2. Right? Back to right heart. Where are the largest veins of your body? Deep in muscle, right? So large veins, deep in muscle. And how do you get venous blood back to your heart? Contraction and relaxation of the muscles and opening of those one-way valves, right? The other way is through the thoracic pump and gravity. Say yeah. So in lymph vessels, there is no pressure. They have one-way valves. As a matter of fact, lymph vessels have more one-way valves than veins. They're a little more porous, too, than veins. They don't carry venous blood back to the right side of the heart. They carry this clear fluid called what? Called lymph. That's something you do like on a Saturday afternoon after you're coming down from a hangover. What are you doing? I'm limping around, man. You ain't doing nothing. Right? And all lymph vessels dump their lymph into the right side of the heart. Say, yeah. Okay. Where are the largest lymph vessels of your body? I'm waiting. Deep inside muscle, right? And probably one of the biggest ways that you get lymph back to your heart is through the thoracic pump. Say yeah. Now, lymph vessels, very important that you understand this. They're more porous. So let me show you. Lymph vessels actually have like little, I don't know, little, you know, western side, you know, you walk into a saloon, you push open the doors. That's what uh, lymph vessels have. So here's an example of a lymph vessel. And then you got these little pores and they have these like little, little doors that as the pressure in the interstitial space begins to increase, it will force those doors open and fluid will enter the lymphatic system. So lymph vessels are much more porous than veins. And there's a reason why that is. It's very important that you understand that. So again, one of the big functions of the lymphatic system is to drain excess fluid and small proteins that have escaped the cardiovascular system and bring it back to the heart. So if you block a lymph vessel, will you be able to get that lymph fluid back? No. So you get a condition called lymphedema. Say yeah. Dead arm ain't never going down. Never. Ever. Ever. Ever? Tell me you got that. 
One of the things I'd like to point out is look at that lady's Timex. <laughs> Takes a licking and keeps on ticking. What? Watch. You ever hear of the elephant man? Right? He had a condition called elephantiasis where he had no lymph vessels or malformed lymph vessels. So fluid would accumulate in his body and he couldn't remove it. That's why he had one big leg and his head was big. Say yeah. yeah. Do you guys want lymphedema? No. no. Write that down. All right. Hang on. Wait. Got some, here we go. Hey. That ain't right. So watch. Anytime you have an, a, you have an extremity, a leg or an arm, that becomes swollen, especially a leg, just one leg, you always think infection and lymphedema. If it's congestive heart failure, it's going to cause all the pressure in the veins to build up, and it's going to build up in both legs. Do you understand that? Okay. Now, we haven't learned this yet. Somebody must have done good in the past. They got check plus and some rims, right? Another function of the lymphatic system is in the small intestines, you have these lymph vessels called lacteals. And lacteals are involved in the absorption of fat and cholesterol in the diet. So the food, the fat and cholesterol that you ate for lunch will not show up in your bloodstream for 10 to 12 hours. So the food that you ate now will not show up in your bloodstream for about 10 to 12 hours. That's why when you want a fasting blood test, a doctor will, you have to fast 10, uh, 12 to 14 hours because the doctor wants to make sure that the triglyceride and the cholesterol that you ate the night before is cleared out of your bloodstream. Say yeah. That's another function. But probably the most important function of the lymphatic system is involved in immunity. And this is where we're going to spend a lot of our time. So what does immunity mean? What is it? It's your body's defense. But what does the word immunity mean? If you catch a case, anybody caught a case recently? No? No, a case. Like, a tr you know, a case of, you know, you go to, go to the judge. Anybody? For snorting crack or something? <laughs> immunity means you are protected. So what does the immune system do? It protects you. Say yeah. yeah. It better protect you. You got me? So there's a couple of things, and you went over this. How many people have had microbiology already? Yeah. Who had microbiology? Okay, come on, cut it out. Don't say help, Timmy. No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> don't help Timmy. Okay, there are, there's a couple of type of immunities. There's innate immunity. What does innate immunity mean? It, right, it's already there. You are born with it. Are you born with skin? Yes. Are you born with tears? Yes. Let's try. <laughs> yep. Are you born with hydrochloric acid in your stomach? Say yes. yes. Are you born with white blood cells? Yes. 
Yeah, you're born with white blood cells. You better be. So examples of innate immunity are skin, which by the way is the best barrier to protection, right? Against infection. The worst thing to happen to someone who is immunocompromised is to have an open wound. That is a site of infection. Intact skin, best barrier. Listen up, because this is true. People who have burns over their body, boy, a large part of their body, the number one reason they die within the first three or four days is fulminate, they go septic. They don't have skin to protect themselves from the environment. Bacteria is all over the place. It gets inside their bloodstream and they die. Say yeah. The other thing is that you have other barriers. So you got your mucus membranes. Mm. Right? You got mucus that uh, has antibacterial properties, that saliva has antibacterial properties. Your private parts secrete mucus that protect you. Say yes. And then you have white blood cells that are preformed when you are born. You got me? And I'm going to go into more detail about that. So that is, that's your innate immunity. Then, you have what's called specific immunity. Or what's called, how do you spell acquired? A C Q. Acquired immunity, right? That means that you have to be exposed to something in order to get immunity to it. Who's with me? And that specific immunity deals with specific, we'll talk about this, specific white blood cells. This you are not born with. In order to get this specific immunity, you have to be exposed to it where you get the disease or you have to be vaccinated by it against the disease or your mother has to pass on antibodies to you while you in the womb. See, yeah. So, let me talk about this. So when you talk about specific or acquired immunity, specific or acquired immunity, I'm not gonna write both. They're broken up into a few classes. One is Passive specific immunity. You got me? And that is where your mama, your daddy, right? Where mom um, gives you. specific antibodies to disease. And that can be transmitted through the placenta, uh, right, through the umbilical cord, mother to child, or it can be transmitted through um, breast milk. That's why people, you know, doctors encourage women to breastfeed babies because you can transmit um, some immunity passively. And then you have um, active active specific immunity. And that is where, watch, when you were, uh, I don't know, a little kid, well, you guys are probably too young, but if a kid in the neighborhood had chicken pox, then 
the parents would say, go over to that kid the chicken pox. So you get chicken pox and be done with it, right? So active specific immunity means that you are exposed to this pathogen. You get the disease that that pathogen causes but then as a result of getting that disease, you build up immunity to that disease. Say yes. Mm -hmm. Then you have artificial specific, whoops, artificial active <coughs> specific immunity. That's when you go to Walgreens and they give you a flu shot. It's artificial because no one's sneezing googies on you and then you get the flu. You got me? But it's the pathogen that is dead or attenuated and actually injected into you, your body's immune system doesn't know the difference. It is going to go into action and then start producing immunity based on yet artificial injection of that um, pathogen. You got me? And then there's one more. This is artificial passive immunity. An artificial watch. If you go to Jimmy John's and there was an outbreak of hepatitis A and you go, hey, I was at Jimmy John's during that time. I ate some sandwiches there. So you go to the doctor and you say, hey, I was there during that time. The doctor will say, pull your pants down and they will shoot your butt with antibodies for the hepatitis A virus. That's artificial passive. Your body's not building up antibodies. It is art you're artificially giving them antibodies. Say yes. And you're need you're gonna need to know some terms, right? Immunoglobin. That is a big fancy word for antibodies. Talk more about that in a minute. You got me? Watch. And titer. Have you heard of these? I bet you have because you're trying to get into the nursing program, right? And they want to know what your MMR titer is and your varicella titer. Say, yeah. So a titer is a blood test that measures antibodies. And there's a threshold based on uh, determined by the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, and the National Institute of Health that determines whether or not they consider you to be immune based on your antibody level or your titer level for a specific disease. So if your titer level is below that threshold, they will say you need a booster shot. Say so, yeah. Okay. All right, some more terms. Ready? What does phylaxis mean?
H. That's a R. What? N? No. Protection. No one knows how to play this game. Sorry. <laughs> it's protection. That's what it means. You got me? It also means chilling out, relaxing, relaxing, playing some b-ball out by the school when a couple of guys who were up to no good started making trouble in my neighborhood. I got in one little fight. My mom got scared. <laughs> Said, you're moving with your auntie and uncle to Bel Air. When I whistled for a cab and when it came near, <laughs> the license plates that fresh had dice in the mirror. <laughs> yep. Okay, watch it. What does prophylaxis mean? You're for protection. If you are anaphylaxis, what are you? You are without protection. Or, you better write this down, anaphylaxis means a total body allergic Reaction. Say yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. This is one time. Allergies are one time the body doesn't do stuff that makes sense. Right? It's overreacting to something. Who's with me? Okay. I asked my general class, what does prophylaxis mean? Rubber. <laughs> I'm like, okay. They tried very hard. Okay. <laughs> All right, now watch. What's this? <laughs> right. Many of you would be considered antigens. <laughs> I ain't writing it down, you are. Antigen is anything anything that produces an immune response. Say yeah. If you lift up your textbook and you get a textbook sliver, because the paper is probably turned to parchment by now, right? If you get a sliver in your finger, what happens to your finger? It gets swollen, red, and painful, right? That's the immune system trying to defend you. Say yes. yes. So anything that produces an immune response is an antigen. What's this? Who said it? What's a pathogen? A pathogen is an antigen that produces disease. Can a sliver produce disease? Can't come to class today, Tim. Got sliveritis. Don't look good. Got to go to the doctor, get some antibiotics. Do you? So a pathogen is an antigen that produces disease. You got me? And do you know about this? The BBP? Big, big black and pretty. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that too. It's well in this class, it's the bloodborne pathogens. Say yeah. What did you say, bloodborne? What? How? 
how many times did I tell you? Watch. Watch. Alaska. Yesterday got the letter. Illegally deaf. Said it like three times. Did she say it three times? I didn't hear you. I can't even hear you. Okay, fine. Be that way. Good. Can she hear this? <laughs> okay, watch. What are the bloodborne pathogens? AIDS. Not AIDS. AIDS is what you get. HIV. 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 What else? Um, Hepatitis. I heard that. Hepatitis what? C. We have all said different <laughs> B. Oh. C. D. And it came up with a new one recently. E. If they find a new strain, what do you think it'll be called? Spitballing. G. Good. So A is what you have to get from someone else? Hepatitis A is not a blood-borne pathogen. Hepatitis A works like this. You go to Jimmy John's, he got to make your sandwich freaky fast. So he making the sandwich freaky fast. And then he goes, I got to go take a deuce. So he drops a deuce in the turlet. And because he got to get back and make your sandwich freaky fast, he ain't got time to wash his hands. So he got a piece of turd on his finger, and when he puts the lettuce on your sandwich, he writes the piece of turd on your sandwich. And because that turd is affected with hepatitis A... Is included in this too? What? I would like Cedip to be you bite into that crap sandwich that's tainted with hepatitis A, you got hepatitis A. Hepatitis A is transferred fecal oral route. That's why I watch. Every restaurant has it. All employees wash hands thoroughly before returning to work. They could care less if you bite into a crap sandwich. What they don't want that crap sandwich is tainted with hepatitis A. It's bad for business. Yes. yes. That's how that works. Thank you for running my sandwich. It was Jimmy John's. So think about, and here, watch. You've got to be a major brain donor on many levels. To piss off a waitress before you get your food, or to piss off a cop before he's given you a ticket. Write that down. Right? Because when they're in the little pit, you don't know what they're doing. They could be peeing in your lemonade for all you know. I'm just saying. People don't know how to win friends and influence people. I generally do go behind the bar and just create a cup of heat to put into terrible customers. I'm writing that down for sure. <laughs> Right, there's only two. Because I, I thought everyone was going to say hepatitis A and then I was going to say no. See, so these are the blood-borne pathogens or uh, big, black, and pretty. If you remember <laughs> it that way. You got me? Now watch. Um, so this has to be direct transfer of, of blood to blood or body fluid to body fluid. So seminal secretions, vaginal secretions contain these blood-borne pathogens. So if you're bumping ugly and you ain't wearing protection and dude or dudette got one of these, you gonna get one of those. Say yeah. That's right. That's why the best thing to do to avoid a blood-borne pathogen is what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> is to read the textbook. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. I'll tell you, um, I think I told you this, didn't I tell you this? That um, 
I was working in Milwaukee. Uh, I was actually doing an internship the summer, um, so it was 1984, right? It was right before I graduated. And um, I was on this med surge floor, and there was a guy who had HIV. And he, he was like six foot seven, and the guy was skin and bones, right? And I remember he's carrying his Foley and he's walking down the halls and everyone's like, that's the guy with the AIDS, right? And I remember, I'm like, it was just sad. You know what I mean? And like, look, watch, watch, watch. Whatever you do in the privacy of your own home, as long as you ain't hurting kids, right? Or hurting anybody else, I don't care what you do, right? Who cares what you do as long as you ain't hurting anybody, right? So, you know, they t call that the gay plague, right? And it was like, oh, you know, this is God's way of, you know, knock it off, right? That's just stupid. But anyways, when I worked down in Dallas, when I worked in the ER down there, I didn't know that Dallas had a huge homosexual population. I just, I didn't know that, right? I'm a guy, I like girls, right? So, like, why would I know that? <laughs> so, anyways, um, Guys would come in and they they had HIV, right? And we would never write HIV positive on the board. We would write fever of unknown origin. So I remember, uh, and I was what, 23? And understand, you guys live in a different world than I was brought up in, right? There was no computers. Your little world is what you saw on TV, read in Life magazine, and your neighborhood. Do you understand? So I didn't know homosexual males kissed. I didn't, know, now I know you think that's funny, but I didn't know that, right? So I'm thinking as a guy, okay, look, you know, I'm horny, okay, I like guys, I get that. But I didn't know they kissed. And I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. So anyways, this guy, this big strapping football player looking guy, he's carrying in this really skinny guy, and he, this guy is sick. So. I said, you gotta put him on the gurney. So I said, are you family? And he said, no. I said, you can't stay here then. You gotta go, I'm gonna have to start an IV and we gotta do some other stuff. And he had pneumocystic pneumonia and his lung was collapsing. So we're gonna have to stick a chest to him. Anyways, so before he left, he kissed him. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I never saw it, right, right? So anyways, I'll never forget, it. this guy had no veins. So I had it started in his hand. And this is before they knew how HIV was transmitted. They didn't know if you could get it sitting on a toilet or somebody breathing on you. I mean, it's no joke. So I remember I grabbed his hand and I had to start an ID and he said, is this gonna hurt? And I looked at him and I said, don't move. And I held that guy's hand so tight. I mean, like I was like crushing his fingers. And I went in and I, I remember watching my hand go like that. Because I thought, what if, do you know what I'm saying? Like, what if I, I miss it and he starts bleeding? And they just didn't know. Then another guy came in. He was just the nicest human being I ever met. And he had a fever of 106.3. This dude was on fire. And he had Kaposi sarcoma. Kaposi, do you ever see the movie Philadelphia? Anyways, what it does is it jacks with your GI tract and you get diarrhea, right? So this guy had diarrhea and he's like, Tim, I gotta go to the bathroom. And I said, hang on. So I grab a wheelchair and the guy weighed probably 110 pounds. And I said, just hang on. So I pick him up and I put him in the wheelchair, right? And I wheel him to the bathroom. And he goes, I don't know if I'm gonna make it. I'm like, hang on. So I park this chair, hold open the door, pick him up about to turn him on to the toilet, right? And he craps all over me. So I had to go get checked for six months, right? To make sure I didn't zero. They didn't know how it was transmitted. And I was taking AZT for six months, right? They didn't know. And I, I just looked at those guys and I'm like, God, it, just, it was just, it was pitiful. Because if you ever see that movie Philadelphia, it's exactly how it is exactly how it is. Those guys would be coming and dying and they looked exactly like they were just skin and bones and they suffocated. That's how it was. 
I'm like, ugh. No one deserves that. Except students who don't read the textbook, maybe. Just saying. Anyways, tell, tell me you got that. And how they believe it was... Watch. You heard about the bird flu? Remember in Japan and China, the bird flu? Viruses don't do that. There are viruses that attack animals, and there are viruses that attack humans. Rarely will a virus simply jump from an animal to a human and infect a human. What they believe is that the HIV virus over time mutated. And they believe it was from guys having sex with animals. That's what they believe. And then over, over time, it mutated and caused that. But the drugs they have now for um, HIV, you can live a normal life. Look at Magic Johnson. That dude looks healthier than I am. They become non-detectable or something like that? Yeah, yeah. And when I show this to you, I'm going to show it to you. Here's the scary part. HIV affects um, cells of the immune system called CD4. They're called helper T cells. Helper T cells turn on your specific immunity. If you don't have helper T cells, you cannot turn on your specific immunity and you are immuno, you have no immune system essentially. Are you following this? So HIV, in order for it to incorporate itself into your cell, it has to bind with a specific receptor. Somebody stop me. <laughs> and when the HIV receptor matches up with that CD4 receptor, it will take that HIV into that CD4. And basically what viruses do is they hold your cells hostage. They say to that CD4 cell, you're not gonna turn on the immune system anymore. You know what you're gonna do? You're gonna become a viral production factory for HIV. And it's gonna use your own DNA and all of your enzymes to make more HIV and then dump it into your blood so it can infect CD4 cells. So that's why in that movie Philadelphia, they kept asking, what's my T cell count? What's my T cell count? So as the T cell count drops, once it hits a certain point, you simply have no specific immunity. And if somebody hacks a lung cookie on you, you die from pneumocystic pneumonia. Pneumocystic pneumonia is all over the place. You can't swing a dead cat without hitting it. It's on that doorknob, probably, yeah, it's all over the place. And the reason it doesn't affect you and doesn't bother you is because you have an intact immune system. It will see that, attack it, create antibodies, destroy it, and you're straight. Say, so, yeah. People with HIV, when they hit that certain T cell count where they have basically no specific immunity, they now have AIDS. Do you understand that? You can be HIV positive and not have AIDS. AIDS is when the T cell count drops low enough where you don't have anything to fight it back with. Tell me you got that. Here's the scary part. I'm going to show you this. There's some people out there that don't have that specific receptor on the CD4 cell. You know what that means? They're HIV positive, but they'll never get AIDS. But they can transmit that HIV virus to other people. Those are the people you got to worry about. That's why. No glove, no love. <laughs> That's how it works. Tell me you got that. Remember. Wait. On the final, if you men mention big, black, and pretty, I'll give you extra credit. <laughs> All right, take a break. Oh, did you have to pee? Yes. Well, why don't you have just go? I'm recording the class. You guys are killing me, all of you. All right, ready? Here we go. The lymphatic system is kind of like your security system at the airport. You got me? 
it don't make no never mind where you're coming or going. You have to pass through security before you can hop on a plane. Are you with me? So the security blanket, right, the security checkpoint of the lymphatic system are the lymph nodes. All, all lymph fluid that is returning to the right side of the heart has to pass through a lymph node and be screened before it can be dumped into the right side of the heart. Are you with me? Where can bad things enter your body? I heard that. <laughs> At the openings of your body, right? What's your biggest opening? Right. That's why you got tonsils. Tonsils are lymphatic tissue. Say yeah. Is there bad stuff in the air? Pull my finger. Find out. When you smell bad stuff, those your nasal airway has to be protected. So your adenoids and your tonsils, your adenoids protect your nasal cavity, your, your upper airway, and your tonsils protect your oral airway. Can you have your adenoids and tonsils removed? Yes, you can. Why don't people get real sick then? Maybe they do. That's because you have a redundancy. Not only do you have lymphoid tissue, so when we were evolving, we would lift up a rock. Hey, look, there's a grub. Right? And you eat it, and there would be dirt on the grub and stuff. Tell me you got that? So they needed that extra protection. We don't. So we have lymph nodes that surround our ears, our oral cavity, say yes. We have cervical lymph nodes, submandibular lymph nodes, supraoracle lymph nodes. That's why I watch. When you go to the doctor, the doctor says, you got a sore throat? He'll, he or she will say, open up and say, ah, ah. They look at the back of your throat, look at your tonsils, and then they do one of these numbers on you. Because they're looking for lymph node involvement. If your lymph nodes are swollen and tender, that means your infection is not being quarantined by the local white blood cells. They're getting their butts kicked and they need additional help. Say yes. And what determines whether or not a doctor prescribes antibiotics is how persistent the patient is or whether there are lymph nodes involved. So if the lymph nodes are swollen, it's almost guaranteed the doctor knows this is a pretty serious infection. Antibiotics are going to help do you follow that? Yeah. So watch. I told you this, right? Go ahead. Why do people get tonsils? I don't know. They just get them. Yeah, I don't know what that's all about. That's weird. And when you get them, you get really bad breath. I know people that have it, man. Their breath be kicking. <laughs> yes? What if you have like a lymph node that's like chronically there, like it never goes away? Like I got one on the back of my neck that never goes away. Are you sure it's a lymph node? I don't know. It's just it gets bigger sometimes. It gets smaller. Um, that may be a uh, that may be a cyst. When you play with it, does it get bigger? Um, yeah, sometimes. Yeah. yeah, don't play with it. Oh. <laughs> well, I just thought. Okay. Um, that's what people do. Why well, you like you get a lump on your on your shoulder, right? You start. Hey. You know, it's like a 
pacemaker. You start playing with it, right? And when you start jacking with it, watch. Your immune system, when you have an infection, what it will do is if it can't push the infection out, and literally that's what it will do, then what it will do is it will put a protein coat around it. That's why when, if you've ever seen like really bad sebaceous cysts, like pus-filled cysts, they have to cut through the skin, then they have to cut through that protein coat. And that's when the, the, the mayonnaise starts coming out. <laughs> Let's go look at one on YouTube. I want the purple stop it. I do that. Do you, do you got me? So when you mess with that, sometimes you can crack open that protein coat and allow the infection to spread. That's why you don't do that. And then if it, do you understand? People love playing with stuff. <laughs> yeah, more than, some more than others. <laughs> I've got another comment to make, but I'll keep that to myself. I can think of other stuff to play with rather than some wump. <laughs> I'm editing this video. Here we go. <laughs> I don't care. Here we go. Um, so watch. All lymph fluid has to go be filtered through a lymph node before it gets dumped into the right side of the heart. You got me? I don't know if you know this, but it's Easter time. How many people watch the Ten Commandments on Easter Sunday? I know. That's a great movie. That's like a great movie. And back then, this was, that was made in like 1956. So they didn't have a lot of special effects back then. That's incredible. Anyways, they left out the 11th commandment. Write this down. It says, thou shalt not get bacteria into the central circulation. You got me? You get bacteria into the central circulation, Dana, and what do you have? You have sepsis. Say yes. If you got sepsis on your chart, it is bad for you. People don't survive sepsis. Rarely. That's how most old people die. They go become septic. Do you know how they get sepsis? They get a urinary tract infection that isn't treated because their immune system compromised and they start getting bacteria to the central circulation and they go septic and die. The thing I don't know is what like women, older women, when they get a urinary tract infection, they may not get a fever. They just get goofy. And I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's due to the, I don't know. But anyways, watch. Tim's going to relate everything right now. Are you ready? Everything you learned up until this point, I'm going to relate. Say yeah. Say you sick. You got sepsis. Are you ready? There are bacteria Watch it. Staph be bad for you. Is staph gram negative or positive? Do you know? Is it gram negative? I don't. You're in microbiology for cry eye. Yeah. Anyways, I forget who cares. Watch. If you get a staph infection in your blood, staph releases a toxin called endotoxin. Where's the staph? And where does the blood circulate? Right, all over. I heard that. You know, I'm going to get a mic from you for you, right? Then when you say the right answer, you know what you can do? Just drop it. <laughs> it releases endotoxin. Where's the endotoxin released? Endotoxin is a massive arterial vasodilator. When you got an infection, what do you get? 
<laughs> no. See, you get fever. Heather, you were real proud of that answer, huh? Yeah. You get sick. You ready? Fever. What does fever do to blood vessels? I heard that too. No. It, that was the other choice. <laughs> fever dilates. That's why when people have a fever, how do they look? Red and warm. Say yes. Where you got the fever? All over. <coughs> what caused the fever? Staph. What did staph release? What does endotoxin and fever do to your blood vessels? Did you just see little birds? There's a kid running past looking at me every single time. I'm about to go close the door. Just close the door. How old is he? He's really little. I don't know. I think he's a new professor. <laughs> Mini me. <laughs> okay, now can we focus? Yeah. Trying to educate. Here we go. Where's the massive arterial vasodilation? You were doing fine reading the textbook. Then you got staph in your blood, it released endotoxin, and then you got a fever. So what happened to all of your arteries throughout your body? So what happens to resistance to arterial blood flow? It goes way down. So what happens to your systolic blood pressure? Goes way down. And if you don't have a mean arterial blood pressure of at least 60, you are in? What caused the shock? Bacteria in the central circulation. And that's called, so you have septic shock. What do you do for people with septic shock? <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> you give them a massive art, wait, don't write that down. <clears throat> what else do they get? <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> so what they will do is they will pack these people in ice. What does ice cold do to blood vessels? What does it do to fever? And if that, and then watch. You, you watch. I'm gonna give you a little hint. When you get into clinical and you start asking questions, they'll say, "What should the nurse assess for first? Right? This is what you assess for first. What will kill them first? Do you understand? Ask yourself that question. What will kill them first? That's what you assess for first. Say yeah. So, what will kill somebody with sepsis first? The drop in blood pressure. So what's your goal? What should you do? Get their blood pressure back up. What caused their blood pressure to drop? Don't say fever. The massive arterial vasodilation. So you can kill two birds with one stone by packing them in ice. That will constrict the blood vessels, increasing resistance, raising their blood pressure. Then you've got to treat the infection that caused it. So you don't get, watch it. You don't give, here, here, dude, have two ampicillin. They get heavy duty IV antibiotics. They bypass the liver so that it doesn't go through the liver. It gets right into the bloodstream and starts killing those bacteria, say yes. Tell me you got that. What'd you say? Why are you talking today? You never talked all semester. <laughs> What'd you say? You think I'm lying? No. 
No one will. Now, listen up because this is true. Endotoxin is inside the bacteria. Exotoxin is outside on the cell wall of the bacteria. So when you start killing bacteria, what do they release even more of? Endotoxin. So this, these people, they will get worse before they get better. And you need to know that. Yeah. And when you take microbiology, you learn all about it. <coughs> take Dr. Matt. He knows everything. He invented microbiology eight years ago. He was at Chili's. He was eating a chicken sandwich. Grilled chicken. Say yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's get back to this. All, all, all. Lymph fluid must go through a lymph node and get filtered of any antigens or pathogens before it gets dumped into the central circulation. Listen up, cuz this is true. Watch it. If you have a cut on your hand like I do, I'm going to show it to you. Watch. If the infection gets really bad, where are the nearest lymph nodes? Under it. We're in advance now. Help, no. help brother out. The axillary. the axillary lymph nodes. So would it be appropriate for a doctor to palpate your axillary lymph nodes if you had an infection in your hand? Yes. Would it be appropriate for a doctor to palpate your inguinal lymph nodes if you had infection in your hand? No. No. Time to get a new doctor. <laughs> so, the nearest lymph nodes are what are palpated to see if the infection has lymph node involvement. That's why if you have a sore throat, they do one of these numbers on you. If you have an infection in your leg, they do one of these numbers on you. Do you follow that? And what's the biggest hole in your body? The biggest, okay. The biggest, big hole. <laughs> I'll just tell you. Your GI tract. So that's why about 70% of your lymph nodes are in your GI tract. Tell me you got that. That's why, watch it. Cancers of the GI tract are very devastating because what's one of the ways that cancer spreads? Through the lymphatic system. Say yeah. yeah. Here we go. Watch. What's one of the functions of lymph nodes? Anyone? Yeah, anyone. Don't say, what, what's going on with you? You're on fire today. <laughs> But are your breasts open to the environment? <laughs> go on one of those sites. Go on some, one of those sites, and we'll see big, black, and pretty <laughs> exposing her nipples to the environment. <laughs> okay. Boy, this class has really gone downhill. Watch. Watch. When you gotta feed your baby, do you take your boob and take a pin and poke a hole in your nipple? No. So are nipples open to the environment? Yes. So do they have a huge lymphatic supply? Yes. Do they have a large lymph node supply? Yes. All lymph vessels drain the breast into the axillary lymph nodes. Say yeah. So if you have breast cancer and they remove the breast, the underlying musculature, and they will remove the associated axillary lymph nodes. Do you follow this? So watch. That's why, how many people work in an hospital? Nobody. You work at, how many people work in a nursing home? 
<coughs> when a woman's had a mastectomy, there's always a sign, don't take blood or drop, to, right? Now you know why. Say yes. Do you know why? Kelly, do you know why? Because it's painful. It's painful on the good arm, too. What's the best protection you have against infection? Intact skin. So watch. What do lymph nodes do? They filter lymph before it gets dumped into the central circulation. What does a woman with a mastectomy not have? She doesn't have axillary lymph nodes. So if you draw blood in that arm, that bacteria has got direct access to the central circulation. And those women can go septic from a blood drop. Why don't you take blood pressure in that arm? That's a blood pressure cup. Look at that. When you pump, 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 pump up the volume, you will push fluid out of the capillary into the interstitial space. How does that fluid normally get back to the right side of the heart? Through lymph vessels, right? But what have you done? You cut the lymph vessels and you remove the lymph nodes. So any fluid that accumulates in that arm will have no way back to the right side of the heart. That's why they got lymphedema. That's why when a woman has a mastectomy, they put a compression sleeve on their arm. That's to increase the pressure in the interstitial space so that fluid doesn't accumulate. The education of Gateway Technical College students continues. You know, we'll explain that to you. Nobody. Say yes. Got that? Watch. Here's a lymph node. This is a very complicated picture. Let me simplify it for you. You got me? Many afferent lymph vessels can go into a lymph node. But there is only one efferent vessel that takes that filtered lymph and dumps it into the right side of the heart. So the, the, a lymph node is kind of like Grand Central Station, right, for filtering of lymph fluid. Are you with me? You're following this. Very good. All right, here we go. This is going to get a little bit dicey. All right, hang on. Where the heck is it? Oh, here we go. You learned in general that you have bone marrow, correct? And bone marrow <laughs> produces all of your red blood cells, right? All of your white blood cells and all of your platelets. So all the formed elements of the blood are formed in the bone marrow. Do you follow, right? What's a, the medical term for marrow? It's mild. Have you ever heard of multiple myeloma? So bone marrow means, mild means bone marrow. You got me? I think I'm spelling that right. Close enough. All right, so this is what I want you to understand. Again, I'm going to simplify this stuff. Ready? All blood cells start out as hematopoietic stem cells. Hem hemat blood poetic form. So all of these white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, all form from these hematopoietic stem cells. 
then they begin to differentiate. So all of these form these hematopoietic stem cells and they will form red blood cells. Are all red blood cells the same? Yes, because they carry oxygen and carbon dioxide, right? So they're structure and function, right? Then, wait, hang on, i got to get some glasses. Then you have platelets. Are all platelets the same? Yeah, because their job is to stop a clot, right? Then you have the white blood cells. Are all white blood cells the same? No, no they're different. That's because you're not exposed to the same thing. You're exposed to different things. Say yes. Better write this down. Better not pout. These are the leukocytes or the white blood cells. Listen up because this is true. These are the white blood cells you're born with. These are the white blood cells that are, I like to refer to as generalized killers, right? They're like the sons of anarchy. They'll kill anything. So you're born with these. And how you remember this and the order of most numerous type of white blood cells to least is never let monkeys eat bananas, right? So the most numerous white blood cell are called neutrophils. Then you have the lymphocytes. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Then you have the monocytes. Then you have eosinophils, and then you have basophils. <coughs> you got me? What's the most numerous type of white blood cell found in your blood? Neutrophils. So neutrophils, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils are, when you're born, they're ready to go to work. They will hunt down bad stuff and kill it. Say yes. The lymphocytes are different. The lymphocytes are the terminators of the body. Lymphocytes have to be programmed. You have to come in contact with a specific antigen or pathogen. Who's following me? And you have T cells, B cells, and the best name for a cell ever, NK cells, which are natural killer cells. These guys, they got tattoos, pack of Marlboro Light Menthol 100 in a box rolled up in their sleeve, ride a hardly soft tail, work second shift at Snap-on, and they're on Dart League at Finney's. And when they come home, they say, hey, baby, I ain't got time for you. I'm hanging out with the fellas. And they drive off. I hate me too. Watch. These lymphocytes, these guys have to be programmed. And know this. You have millions and millions of different types of lymphocytes. And each lymphocyte is programmed to kill one and one thing only. If it's not programmed to kill it, it ignores it. Do you understand? So it is analogous to you going to a party with 5,000 people and you only know one person. What's your goal? Your goal is to get something to drink, suck them down real quick so you got a little buzz working, and then find that one person. Say yes. The other people you ignore, you don't even care about, right? So that's T cells, B cells, and NK cells. They're designed to kill and attack one and one thing only. Say yes. And they have to be turned on. 
They have to be exposed to that specific thing. Who's with me? Guys? All right. So watch. I'm going to give you a couple of, couple of terms here. Immunity, man, the immune system is, look, I've, I had four courses, four semester-long courses in immunology. I'm going to explain this to you in less than three hours, right? I'm not expecting miracles, right? I'm expecting a good effort. Here we go. I don't care what anybody says. <coughs> Diapedesis is probably the greatest name for a rock group ever. Let's hear it for Diapedesis. Don't you think that would be a great name? I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to have a web page named Diapedesis. That way when somebody tries to use that name, they're going to pay me big money. <coughs> Who, who's following me? Prostaglandins you're familiar with, interleukins, bradykinins, right? I'm just going to tell you right now. These guys, they, they form a, uh, perform a couple of functions. Number one, they're chemoattractants. All right? L let me explain this. When white blood cells see prostaglandins, interleukins, and bradykinins, they are attracted to that area. Tell me you got that. So these chemoattractants attract white blood cells to an area of an antigen or pathogen. Say yes. Mast cells when they're ruptured, they release histamine. You got me? Who's with me so far? Macrophage are Monocytes, monocytes that are turned on Does anyone know what diapedesis means? It, yeah, that's exactly it. How thick is a capillary? So where are white blood cells? Wait, white blood cells. 
They're in the blood. Not really, though. Kind of lied. White blood cells are in the blood and lymphatic system. But they're primarily found in the blood. What do cops do? What do patrolmen do? What do they do? <laughs> she said eat them. <laughs> what did she say? <laughs> no, I said eat them. Oh. Patrol cops patrol. Where does the blood circulate? Everywhere. So white blood cells patrol all the cells of the body. Tell me you got that. When they see a criminal, what do they do? No, they just ignore them. Go on break. Update their Facebook status. They will attack it. Where does arterial blood always go? I'm going to explain to you now the process of inflammation. I want this whole thing. Don't hate, appreciate. I got some good videos on the immune system too. Just so you know, I'm gonna take them off. Why? Just to be a hater. You should be a congratulator. So you can <laughs> <laughs> Don't hate, congratulate, yeah. Okay. Here we go. Want this whole thing. Ready? This is so good. And watch. Everything that you've learned up until this point. Timmy, bring it home. Everything. Okay, hang on. Oh. This is important. Friday, or Thursday after your final. You got me? I'm going to a bar called the Clubhouse. It's right across the Kenosha, from the Kenosha campus. It's in Kenosha on 30th. You can go to any other bar. <laughs> you got me? Whose phone's going off? I think that's mine, sorry. Go ahead and answer it, Dana. You're good. You're special. You can do whatever you want. Who doesn't love Dana? Did I see somebody put their hand up? No. Go ahead, I dare you. Okay, hang on. What? Just so you know, I treat everyone the same, poorly. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. All right, let me let me go through a part of this, okay? Then uh, you can ambulate because I got to congratulate some students. Ready? Write this down. In all the tissues of your body, all the tissues of your body, all the tissues of your body, you have these cells called mast cells. What do mast cells contain? Histamine. Histamines do two things. Two. Two things in one. They're a massive arterial vasodilator and they increase capillary leakiness. They actually kind of punch holes in the capillary membrane and they allow the capillary to become more leaky. What's in the capillary? Blood. What's blood mostly made out of? 
If you have a water balloon, you punch a hole in it, what does the water do? It'll, what? It leaks out, right? Tell me you got that. So if you start losing water from the blood, where do the formed elements of the blood normally circulate? What part of the vessel? The middle. But if the capillary becomes leaky and fluid starts leaking out of the capillary, those white blood cells start getting closer to the edge of the capillary membrane. Who's following this? And when they get close enough to the capillary membrane, they will actually bind to some proteins. And when they bind there, they will actually squeeze through those small cracks that were created through a process called diapodesis. Oh, oh. Who's with me? It's all being recorded here, peeps, for posterity. This will go down in history as probably the greatest thing ever. Okay, watch. When you damage tissue, you rupture mast cells. What do mast cells contain? Histamine. So when the histamines are released in that damaged area, what do they do to the local arteries and arterioles? They cause them to dilate. And where does arterial blood always go? Where are white blood cells? In the blood. So where are white blood cells going to go? And they're going to go to the damaged area as a result of the release of histamine. Oh, here we go. Who's following this? So watch. Somebody don't like you, so they take a broom handle and they stab it into you. Are you following? You have now broke the skin. These things that appear to be green Tic Tacs are actually bacteria. Tell me you got that. Oh, you're, who? somebody's going to get this. Whoever gets this gets some coupons for Burger King. Oh boy. Yeah. I took the goo, buy one Whopper, get one free. That's already, that's gone. Now watch. How does the immune system know that that's a bacteria? White blood cells got eyes. <laughs> yeah, now you're backpedaling there. Oh, she just waved me off. You know what? I take back the big, black, and pretty. Yeah. There's no more extra credit. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about there's no extra credit for that now. You came up with it, and then she yells at me. Waves me off. Yeah, that hurt my feeling. I'm just kidding. It just happens. You have a group of proteins on all your cells called the... Major histocompatibility complex. That's right. Now it's too late because I already told you. <laughs> all the cells of the body have that major histocompatibility complex. What don't bacteria have? Major histocompatibility. So anything that enters your body that doesn't have the major histocompatibility complex attached to it is it considered an antigen and your immune system will attack it. That's how it knows to attack it. Say yes. So here we go. So you got stabbed with a broom handle? <laughs> you got me? <coughs> Forget about that. I'm going to cut to the chase here. Those little selectins are the white, what the white blood cells bind to, but watch. Mast cells are going to release what? Histamines. What do histamines do to? That's right, so watch. Histamines are released, capillaries become leaky, and the arteries dilate. So where's the vast majority of that oxygenated blood going to go? To the damaged area. That's why the damaged area becomes red and warm. Say yes. And because of the capillary leakiness, the plasma from the capillary is going to 
go into the interstitial space. That's why the area becomes red, warm, and swollen. Who's following? So as the plasma leaks out, the white blood cells that were normally flowing in the middle will now bind to those little proteins created on the edge of the capillary. And through the process of diapedesis, the white blood cells will squeeze through those pores created by histamine, and they will begin to move towards the bacteria because they do not have the major histocompatibility complex. And through the process of phagocytosis, oh, somebody stop me. They'll squeeze through and they will begin to attack those pathogens. What color are white blood cells? Please get this right. Okay, don't hate, appreciate. They're white blood cells. That's why when you pop a zit, the pus is white. That's white blood cells accumulating there. Tell me you got that. Now watch. When a white blood cell, right, a neutrophil, because who's first to arrive on the scene? When they come in contact with a pathogen, they will begin to release. Oh, son of a... They will begin to release prostaglandins, interleukins and bradykinins and those chemicals do several things one of which call on other white blood cells say hey buddy we're, we, we found some bad things we need some help help a brother out and they will go to that area where their chemicals are released and attack those particular cells that's how you get a clump of bacteria and white blood cells. Say yes. Watch it. Watch it. Prostaglandins also do a couple of things. Prostaglandins will increase the inflammatory response. It will cause marked arterial vasodilation and it will also increase the capillary leakiness, right? That will cause even more fluid and more white blood cells to go to that area. Do you follow this? Prostaglandins also stimulate receptors in the area called nociceptors. What do nociceptors set? Pain. So prostaglandins stimulate nociceptors in that area and you get pain. Pain is diagnostic. Pain tells you that there's something wrong. When you go to the doctor, the, you say, doctor, it hurts when I do that, don't do that. That's good advice. So one of the things that happens when you have pain is it causes immobility. And you want that joint or whatever to be immobile because if you keep moving it, you won't be able to heal it. Do you follow this? That's why if you've got a bad ankle, it hurts to walk on it because you're not supposed to walk on it. Say yes. Okay, watch. Have you ever heard of ibuprofen? Have you ever heard, ever heard of aspirin? They inhibit the synthesis of prostaglandins by white blood cells. That's why ibuprofen can be used as an anti-inflammatory and an analgesic. You don't think that's cool? Yes. No one will explain that to you. You know what? I'm going to end it right there because I feel real good about myself right now. <laughs> I do. I did good. <laughs>